amazed by um, what community is all about. I love Restoration Chapel. I love our family here. Um, you're all family now, and, and, and I thank you so much for being here this morning. And the, uh, I know a lot of churches say it, and I don't mind saying the best is yet to come. There's greater things in store for every single one of us. You know how I know that? You know how I know how I have hope? I have hope because um, Sister James was telling me that she, she pulled me aside before service. She said, we have some of the greatest youth. And I, I said, what do you mean? She said, I just asked them, could they help um, some of the senior ladies come across the street? And they didn't mind taking their arm and crossing the street with them. I've seen young people and I've seen adults and, and our seniors and, and our adults here yesterday cleaning this building. And then not only cleaning this building, but when they got done, we prayed over all these seats and just asked God just to move in mighty way. I've seen our youth pastor not minding. I know it's rough on them and I know it's a little change for them. They're moving their service to Tuesday night. So our, our adults can be out here on Tuesday night or Wednesday night. And the youth's going to be there on Tuesday night. Yes, some of them are not going to be able to make it and they understand. But, but I, I thank God that they're willing to say, hey, let's keep this going. Amen. Amen. It's all about Jesus. And you want to know where your church is at. And I love it because you find out a lot about your church when things get rough. Amen. 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 And I thank God for that. We were on vacation last week, and and we went, because I, I think we're the only people in the world that go to church when we're on vacation. Uh, we went to a service last week, and it was amazing. The Spirit got to move in, and I loved it because I got the week off, but Sister Sherry didn't because they found out she was coming. They asked her to sing. Uh, and so I got to sit in a pew and actually worship, and she actually had to sing, and it was great. And uh, but the Spirit got to move in, and, and, and I got to pray with a, a, a gentleman who just gotten saved. I didn't know it at the moment, but he got saved about a month earlier. Him and his family did. And I got to pray with him and talk with him. And I was so excited because he was telling me things that was going on in his life. And as he was telling me those things, I began to think about people here at Restoration Chapel and the things that have been going on here, the people that have been healed, the people that have been saved, the families that are being restored, the, the, the friendships that are coming together, how we're reaching this community, and, and I'm excited about that. Now, I know we're in a building where my voice is going to echo even more, but I'm probably going to get even louder, amen, because I'm excited about what God is doing in this movement, this movement of God that says, listen, I, I love it because we'll find out with the, with, with the disciples as they go out and start preaching, people start coming at them like we talked about two weeks ago when Stephen, who stood up boldly, stood up boldly and preached the gospel, as they begin to stone him, he knew because he was full of the Holy Spirit. He didn't care that they were stoning him. He just said, forgive them. God, forgive them. That's the boldness of this movement. This movement says, as I said earlier, it doesn't have to be about a sanctuary. Wherever we get together, we can do the work of God. Amen? Amen. If it's here, if it's at the park, if it's at the judgment house, if it's at the skating ring, if it's at Zaxby's, if it's at Chick-fil-A, we can still let this movement go. Because listen, as boldly as we get to moving, as we allow the Holy Spirit to fill us. Listen, I love it because when the Holy Spirit fills us, it fills us to a point where it just has to come out. Amen? Right. Have you ever just been so excited? I, I used to hate when I had to buy, I still hate it, when I had to buy Sherry a surprise gift. I hate it because I usually wait to the last minute because if I don't, as soon as I see her, I'll be like, hey, I got you this. No. And she's like, really? There wasn't no surprise in that, amen? That's the way I feel every time I think about Jesus. That I just have to let it out. Amen? I just have to let it out. The more I seek Him, the more I find him. The more I find him, the more I love him. Because I realize the more that I find him, the more that he loves me. Amen. Amen. I um, and we're gonna get to the message here in a second, but I was telling the the group Wednesday night that came to Bible study as I was in uh, uh on vacation, God spoke to me and and he opened my eyes about some things and, 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 some, and just things going through my mind. It's just amazing what God is doing and, and what he's going to do. But do you realize for somebody to get saved, it has to be a miracle? Amen. 
See, a lot of us want miracles to happen. A lot of us want to see people rose from the dead. A lot of people want to see people healed. A lot of us want to see people, all these things happen. But you realize when somebody gets saved, it is a miracle. The Bible says if you're in sin, then it's like you're dead. You're dead altogether. Now, I love it because I was listening to Francis Chan. If you ever get a chance to listen to him, he's an awesome pastor. All he cares about is loving people. That's all he cares about, which that should be all of us. But anyway, uh, he just loves people. And he said, do you realize when you go out and, and speak the gospel, when you go out to outreach, do you realize you're basically ministering to a graveyard? We ever thought about that? You see, because you're ministering to people that are dead in Christ. And he said, I want you to think about this. If you took after service today, if you decide to go to the graveyard, what would you take with you to rise somebody from the dead? Would you take somebody that can speak well? Because that don't really mean anything, right? Amen. Would you take a band with you? Would you ask Sister Sherry and Brother G and Tanil and Faith and, and, and Sabrina and them to go with you and, and sing for a little while? No, that don't really matter. It has to be a miracle from God. Some of us got to realize that we need to abide in God so we can have that presence come upon us. We need to get that spirit of God where we said miracles are going to happen in this movement. That people are going to be saved. That people are going to be changed. Church, we need to get to the point where we love people so much and we love God so much that we realize it's not about who we are or our talents. But it's all about the spirit of God moving through us. Moving through us. As we were fixing some of this stuff up, I feel bad for Brother Shorty. He's going to be sitting here looking at my back on that. <laughs> but as we were getting some of these things together, some people were asking about an altar. And, and I was racking through my mind about how to put up an altar and, and, and put this up. But you know, I, I got to thinking about this a lot overnight because I was going to come and bring some things out. And stuff. But you know what? I, I think the best altar that we can find is to grab each other's hands and begin to pray for each other. Amen. To unite together, no matter the color, no matter the age, no matter the, 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 uh, how poor you are, how rich you are, to come together and grab hands and just minister to each other and let the Holy Spirit flow through each and every one of us. Yeah, there we have a place of sacrifice, but we also have people in Christ, the body of Christ. And listen, church, I believe, and I, and I really believe this because the Bible talks about it, when we become one, then people will see that God is moving. When it's not about what we think, but it's about what God thinks. When we allow the Holy Spirit to move through us, then we'll have a movement like we've never seen before. If you have your Bibles, better get going. Acts 9, verses 1 through 19. A lot of us know this story. It's a major story in the Bible. And goes like this. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any of there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus in his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus for three days. He was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision. Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on, on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tyrus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he, he had seen a man named Ananias come and place his hand on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man. Isn't that like Christians? Amen. I've heard a lot of things about this guy, right? Yes, God, I'm listening to you, but I heard a lot of stuff about him. He said, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go. 
This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will know him now how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it, placing his hands on Saul. And he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized and after taking some food, he regained his strength. This morning, as I said, we're going to continue this series, The Movement. And it gets us to this Acts 9. And I want to ask you a question. What gets us to the point where we want to change everything? What gets us to the point where we want to change everything? You see, the Bible talks about this change a lot. One of my favorite scriptures in 2 Corinthians 5 and 17 says this. It says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. But I love this last part. All things are what? Passed away. And behold, all things are become new. Listen, I love this because I want you to think about this. God says, if you give your life to him, the old things are passed away. Isn't that just great? Amen. All the old things are passed away. But you know what the problem I find out is? We go to the altar, we pray for salvation, but we pick up those things as we leave. Amen. We still pick them up and we still take them with them. He says those things are passed away. And if we go to the altar, we put them at a place to sacrifice. But we don't leave them there. So when we come out, we pick them up, we take them out the door with us, and nothing has changed in our life. We just had an emotional moment. We just cried a little bit. We felt peace for a second. But then we picked it up and ran with it. Why do we do that, church? Why do we get to that point? I see so many people that want to go and get this new creature in their lives to, for the old things to be passed away. But I find out that we can take it with us. What I mean is there's a lot of us that will pray for salvation or even more. But when we leave, we fail into the same place we did before, before we went to the altar. The old things don't pass away. And we're still in the same place. And as I was studying, God brought to me a scripture in Isaiah 6. You see, Isaiah has a vision from God. And in this vision, he sees God sitting on the throne around him. And there were creatures crying out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And the whole earth is full of his glory. And then the Bible says, The post of the doors begin to move. And the house was filled with smoke. But the next part is what really gets me in Isaiah 6 and 5. It says this, Then say I, Woe is me, for I am unclean. I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. You see, this is where I want to get at. And I love this because you know what happened to Isaiah? When he had a true encounter with God, what happened? His whole life changed forever. <laughs> It wasn't about an emotion, amen. It wasn't about a song, amen. It wasn't about a great word a preacher preached, amen. It wasn't about flashing lights and fog machines, amen. It wasn't about an outreach event. It wasn't about somebody speaking to him. It was about a miracle because he saw God. And when he saw God, his mouth, he began to realize that I am not worthy, amen. See, some of us need to get to the point where we come to God and say, listen, I, we have a true encounter with God. A true moment where we get on our knees and we can't even stand ourselves anymore because we realize that we are so unclean. Oh, my lips are unclean. Oh, I am undone. Oh, I need a change in my life. Church, the only way you'll change is when you realize that you're wrong. Amen. I am. Um, I think I, sometimes I think I'm a piano player. <laughs> I can play a mad Mary Had a Little Lamb. <laughs> I mean, it's just great. When I play, it's like fireworks come off. And people just lay to sleep because it's so beautiful. And all this. But then I get excited and I think I can go from Mary Had a Little Lamb 
to maybe like, uh, you know, that song on Big, you know, where they use their feet. I don't even know what's called, that chopsticks or whatever it is. And you know what it sounds like? A bunch of racket. <laughs> it don't sound nothing like it. And then I think, hey, if Sister Sherry does it, I can play healer, right? And it don't come out healer. It needs some healing, amen. Uh, it don't come, you know, I, I can claim to do all kinds of stuff. But you know when do I, I realize that I'm not a piano player? When I'm not doing it right. Amen. So I realized very quickly that I had to fix those things. I had to change those things. I realized that, hey, because I'm not this way, if I want to become a piano player, you know what I got to do? I got to sit down and practice. I got to sit down and change. Listen, some of us as Christians need to get into the book a little bit more. Some of us as Christians need to pray a little bit more. Some of us as Christians need to worship a little bit more. Some of us as Christians need to realize that we ain't as perfect as we think we are. Amen. Amen. I'm not here to make you doubt your salvation, but I'm here to tell you there's always things you can work on. Amen. Praise God. It don't matter if you're a preacher, a deacon. It don't matter if you're a bishop. It's still, you're going to have to change some things in your life. Amen. And listen, the only way you're going to change is when you look into the mirror and realize, amen, you realize that you're not as good as you think you are. Amen. amen. <laughs> Do you realize salvation is more than a name change? Amen. Some of us just want the title. Wouldn't it be great if we all had, hey, my name is, on my shirt? You know what I'm saying? We say, hey, my name is Christian, and then we go out and act like a, ooh, ooh. A lot of us want to be on church and be all holy on Sunday, but there's a weekday we want to be ourselves. And we got to start looking into the mirror and realize we're not as good as we're supposed to be. You see, Isaiah looked up at God, and when he saw God, he seen how great our God is. Some of it, the more I seek you, the, some of us have stopped seeking God. <clears throat> I was telling somebody a couple weeks ago, we were at a revival, me and my wife were, and I was so excited. This guy, was he was a uh, prophetic speaker. He could tell you what's going on in your life. And the reason why I know that is because he said a lot of things that went on. He would tell people things that, that were going to happen in the next year. And guess what? It happened because God had showed it to him. And he come up to me and he began praying for me. And he didn't say nothing bad. And I was excited. And he was like, you know, the Spirit of God is good on you. And, and God's doing this and that. And I was like, praise God, I cleaned all that out just a couple of minutes ago. You know what I'm saying? And, and he's like, hey, you know, God's going to do great things. You know? I was like, thank you. So whenever they say pray for salvation, you better go ahead and pray it. Because somebody might come give you a word. Um, and, 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 and then I was, I was kind of excited. I kind of got big head. You know, he said, he said this was going to happen. And then he said over my wife, who I was praying for too. And he, he went to put her hand, his hands on her. And he backed up. And he said, I can't even pray for you. Because you're sitting at the throne of God. Amen. That's amazing for her. But do you know what that did to me? <laughs> It made me look in the mirror and say, I better start seeking God a lot more. <laughs> Do you realize that sometimes we've got to be told? <laughs> I know you don't like it when somebody preaches and they say something and you're going through it. And you think, oh, they just read my Facebook because you put it on there. Amen. But uh, <laughs> they, they, did you just read my diary or, or you read, you listen to my phone calls or anything like you? I know you feel bad when that But you know what? Sometimes we need our toes stepped on. That's right. <laughs> Trust me, my wife will tell me when I'm wrong. Amen. Amen. But you know what? I don't look at it as a bad thing. I look at it as, hey, she's trying to help me become a better person. God's trying to help you. You see, we got to have these encounters with God. we got to have these moments where we come and sit in front of God and realize that this movement comes inside of us, that this Holy Spirit comes inside of us and changes who we are. Every time we get into the presence of God, we should want to change. You see, the Bible tells us that when we have a true experience with God, we do a 180 and change our lives. And yeah, it's hard to battle with the flesh. But when God shows up, we don't want to go back to the sin in our lives, which brings us to our text today. You see, Saul, who, who was there when Stephen was stoned, he was there. He was going to go persecute uh, 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 the, 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 the Christians. As a matter of fact, Acts 8 3 says this, as for Saul, he made habit of the church. Amen. He, he was the guy. He was the guy standing outside and 
dead because they believed in Jesus. Saul. Some, some of you will realize here in a few minutes, he gets a name changed to Paul, and he basically writes the whole New Testament. He basically tells us about this movement and how this movement goes on. But do you realize that before he was that, he was the one that was persecuting every one of the Christians? Do you realize that your past, it don't matter what your past is, God can change it. Amen. If you have a true encounter with God, God can change it. Amen. I don't care if you're a murderer, you're a drug dealer, you're a prostitute. It don't matter what you are. God can change who you are. And church, it's time that the church realizes that and stop throwing people out just because they're not like us and start letting them come in and see the presence of God upon them. And you know what I come to realize? If you're in the presence of God, it don't matter who else comes in the door because you getting changed and somebody else will get changed. Amen. 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 I, I know a lot of times I pray and I don't think I was that bad of a person, but I realize without God, I'm nothing. God can change you. Amen. Somebody need to hear that today. Your past doesn't define you. Praise God. What the world labels you, amen. It's not what God labels you. We want to throw everybody on the bus and call them this, this, that, and that. You know what? God labels you as the child of God as long as you give your life to Him. He labels you as He loves you. And I love it when you give it to Him. He labels you as forgiven. If the world won't forgive you, He still will. If your friend won't forgive you, He still will. If your spouse won't forgive you, He still will. But all you have to do is have to encounter with Him. See God. Seek God. Seek God. See Saul. This bad guy, Saul, was a man that was very educated. He was an enemy to Christianity. 1 Timothy 1 and 13 called Saul, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor. And, but I attained mercy because I did it ignorantly and unbelief. Verse 1 of Acts 9 shows us that, his, that he had this rage against Christian religion. As a matter of fact, he was going to another place to kill Christians. going to another place to kill Christians. But I love it because I look at him and I want to I want to judge him, I want to yell at him, I want to fuss at him, but then Romans 3 and 23 says this. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Amen. It don't matter who you are, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And I'll let you know that God wants to use the sinner. Not as they are now, but because he knows what they're becoming. Church, if God wants to use sinners, then why are we not wanting sinners to come to our place of worship? Why are we not going out of the way to show those that are lost how great our God is? We need to change our thinking and realize that, yes, we must grow in the Lord. But when we have an encounter of God, we should want to let the world know how great he is. You realize our mission is to restore a community to the knowledge and works of God. If you don't ever tell nobody, how are you going to restore it? Hey, man. How are you going to restore it? You've got to get to that point in your lives. Saul was one of those guys. In verse 3, we see him walking down the road. And about this time, suddenly, a shining light came. And in verse 4, it talks about how he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why, why do you persecute not me? You see, this light was so bright and the power of God was so much that Saul fell down on his face in front of God. Have you ever had one of those moments in your life? Some of you fell literally, but some of you just had to get to your lowest point to realize that God's still there. And then God shows up and it hits you so hard. You realize, have you ever had those times where you just cry? I know, I'm supposed to be manly and not tell you this, but sometimes I just cry. I, mean, I don't even do it with my wife. I don't want her to think me and not think they bad about me. So sometimes when I'm driving in my car, if I don't wave at you, I might be crying. So don't get mad at me. Sometimes I have to just come to God and just let go. 
and let the presence of God just touch me to a point where I realize I, I, I don't know what's going on around me. I just know what God's doing inside of me. You see, Saul, this light came, and it hit him so hard, and he fell down. And I love it because when he fell down, it was amazing. He, he said, I, I love it because God said, why are you persecuting me? God is calling out to many of you this morning and saying, why are you running from me? Why are you disobeying me? Why are you not worshiping me? Why are you not seeking after me? Why are you not coming close to me? Why are you not witnessing? Why are you not doing my plan? And a lot of us take that voice and we put it in the background because we don't want to let anybody else to see that we have something wrong in our lives. And we just let it go back. But church... God is going to make a moment and you have a true encounter with Him, He'll change your life forever. Change your life forever. You just got to get to that point in your life. You see, when Jesus shows Himself to our soul, then we become humble and we realize that we're not worthy to even look at Him because of the things we have done. Job did the same thing in chapter 42, verses 5 and 6. He said this, I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye seeth thee. Wherefore I adore myself and repent in dust and ashes. Even Isaiah said, woe is me, for I am undone. Church, how do we ever expect to change if we never come face to face with Jesus Christ? The Bible says, then he hears this voice from heaven. This voice of heaven comes to him. He realizes who it is. The sinner knows the voice of God. He said, I said Why, Lord? What are you doing? The Bible says he went blind for three days. Some people don't want to know why he went blind, but this is what just God gave me. Sometimes you got to get out the distractions before you can realize who God is. You have to look at yourself first. Can you imagine being having sight for all your life, then all of a sudden you go blind? You know what you start doing? You start thinking about what's going on on the inside. Some of us are comparing ourselves to other people. Praise God. And we're not as bad as those people, so we're okay. But no, you know what? God says you need to compare yourself to me. And you know what? You'll never be God, but praise be to God. He'll show you where to fix yourself. He'll show you how to change. I believe that's the reason why Paul had to go blind. Because he had to realize it was about him now. It wasn't about everybody else. It was about what's going on inside of him. Can you imagine the praying that was done when he was blinded? How much he prayed. But I also love you. Know, he fell to his face. He gave it to God. He lost all his strength. And God's the one that provided the strength back. You know how he did that? He used a Christian. Praise God. One that didn't even want to go because he thought he was going to get in trouble. He still called him out. And he said, listen. I know he didn't say this, but I can think, I can just... Just feel the presence of what he told Anna. You know, he said, listen, I know, but he's going to be an instrument for me. And when he said that, I bet you, honey, that, that Anais felt the presence of God all over him and realized that nothing can stand against you. And it wasn't about me now. It's all about him. The Bible says that he goes and he begins to pray for him. And as soon as he begins to pray for him, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. It said that his eyes began to open. Matter of fact, he said things that looked kind of like, like skin on a fish, it fell off. The scales fell off. Do you realize when you have an encounter with God, those things that are keeping you away from God will fall off? We read the scripture that said the old things are passed away. Amen. That blindness was passed away. As a matter of fact, it showed him because it fell off right there. And he began to see. And I bet you I, I can see it in his eyes when he began to see. You know what he began to see? The spirit of God. The presence of God. He didn't see that hatred anymore. That evil anymore. Church, I know we have a, a world where people are fighting against each other because of color, because of rain, all this other stuff. But you know what? When you allow the Holy Spirit to get off of you, those scales of evil will fall.
fall off. Those scales of hatred will fall off. And now you'll have a mindset of love, of peace, of joy, of long suffering, of hey, it don't matter about me anymore. I'm going to do this for God. I'm going to do this so people know who he is and how great he is. I'm going to do this because he's my healer and nothing is impossible. Amen. Nothing is impossible. Amen. Where are you at today, church? Where you at today? I am. Uh, next week we're gonna get out of Acts for a little bit as we talk about this movement. And I told you I've been praying. It's amazing because I say I'm sleeping, but God wakes me up all the time. And he woke me up the other night when we was on vacation, and he brought the scripture up that says, "Love God with all your heart." Your mind, with all your soul. You didn't stop there because a lot of times, man, I was, I was getting, I was getting blessed when he said that. You know, I was gonna love God. He said, love people. And it's something that we all say and we all think about and we all try to do. But church, I, I know we can get theological. We can look at things that happen in the Bible, and that's great and that's awesome. But if we don't do those two things in loving God and loving people, it doesn't matter how much we know. God's not going to move. This movement of God is about us as a church uniting together and loving people, not, not people that we already like. We had our wedding. It was amazing when we had our wedding. Have you ever sat down and did the invitation list for a wedding? Isn't that horrible? Because there's some people you've got to cut. Just because it's $40 a head most of the time when you feed them. Amen. Yeah. I know poor TJ. He's fixing to get married. like, oh, Lord. <laughs> if it's not $40, it's still a lot of money because you've got to get food together and stuff like that. Still, so you got to make some cuts. Amen. Sometimes that third, fourth, fifth cousin down the line that you had not seen in three years, he can't come. I know your mama wants him to come, but sometimes he just can't come. You know what? I begin to think about how amazing it is Jesus let sinners dine with him. The people that nobody loved, he would go dine with them. Isn't it great that Jesus dined with you? Yes. He dined with you. He didn't mind going out of the way, out of the way to touch your heart, no matter who you were. 